I think that's such an important promise. And for weeks now, we've been thinking about one of the biggest missions that you'll ever face in your life, and we've summarized it this way. You say that nothing is more important in your life than being one of God's tools to form a human soul. And there are so many things in life that are so important. We've all got a lot on our plates. We've all got lots of decisions and priorities going on. There are a billion things that you can chase after that distract you. But as you follow the Lord, nothing is more important in your life. There is no greater task that God gives people giving him glory than to be one of God's tools to form a human soul. And this is true for everybody. If you're an employee or a customer, a student or a teacher, a healthcare worker or a patient, if you're a kid or a parent, you've got nothing more important than being one of God's tools to form human souls. And God is just so big and faithful and amazing. He uses each of us in different ways to influence the people who God has put around us. And this is a topic that fits, of course, this morning's service. And we had a baptism this morning. And what do we do in baptism? Well, you all as a community stood and you promised that you are going to together be one of God's tools. That God is going to use your influence in the life of Mason. Right? We, we saw parents stand here and promise that, you know, God, I will let you use me to raise this kid. And we saw in baptism God pointing at Mason saying, this one is part of my people. And I have lots of tools in my toolbox to help this young man grow up to be a man of God. Like, what we're doing is so important. By the way, this is why our church does so many things that we do. I mean, something as simple as serving in kids' church. By the way, our church is amazing. You all run youth group, cadets and gems. You, uh, we, we do 252 Kids Church, uh, Wiggling Worship Nursery. Uh, I have not listed all the things we do to help influence young people, but we, I think one of the things I love about this church is we embrace our calling to do exactly this, to be influences for the Lord. And that's, uh, we talk about kids in baptism a lot, but we do this in so many other things. Coffee break, uh, Bible studies. We do things to support elderly and young people. I mean, just we work so hard at doing exactly this. I, I even think about it, even something as casual as a conversation after church, when you're chatting around coffee or strawberries or in the parking lot. Like, this is what we do. We support each other. Because nothing is more important in your life than being one of God's tools to support or to form human souls. The problem is, if you've done this, you probably can't think of a whole lot of other things that are more exhausting than working with people, right? If you've allowed God to use you to influence people, if you've served in ministry, if you've led Bible studies, or even like forget about church for a second, if you're a really good boss or a parent, you could probably change this a bit and you could say nothing is more, I don't know, frustrating in your life, right? Nothing's more confusing, nothing's more exhausting in our life sometimes than when God wants to use me to influence people. That's the downside of this task, right? It's exhausting. It's frustrating. And we could talk a lot, again, about how much, our work, or how much work our church has done to try and invest in difficult people. We could talk about all the time and resource we've spent trying to help people who just we couldn't really influence. Sometimes, I'll be honest, this task is disappointing. Or forget church, we talk about how exhausting parenting is. Amber, Alex, I, I wish I could tell you that this water would, uh, I don't know, help Mason sleep through the night. Or, uh, he seems like really well behaved right now. Or uh, wouldn't it be great if this water could help with teething pains or uh, any of the other challenges of parenting? Uh, but I'm, maybe it'll work. I, I, I just, I'm not counting on it, though, because parenting is exhausting. And there's no real simple solutions. The fact is, and we're going to talk about this today, this task is work, it can be frustrating, confusing, distracting, and it can also be isolating. Let's talk about that. What's, what's frustrating about it, I think, is at the end of the day, you could say, God, use me to work with this person, but ultimately, we are powerless to change human hearts. I remember uh, years back, I, uh, I think we were a, a class at school or something, I read this book on parenting. 
and they made the task of raising kids so simple. Like, here's the black and white rules, do this, the kid will do this, uh, follow this guy's simple instructions. And I had to like, write a book review on it, and I figured out it was written by an older single dude who never had kids. I'm not even sure that he ever talked to kids, <laughs> because the fact is, uh, it's not that simple. The fact is, there is no hard-cut rules to changing the lives of people. But I don't need to tell you this, because you've seen this firsthand, right? You've all seen good parents and good churches and communities, or you've seen good bosses who've done everything right and still fail at influencing people, right? You know this because a lot of us have these, this list of people on our prayer list of people who seem to be raised perfectly, and they're just a disaster, and you can't do anything except pray, because everything we can't do doesn't work. It's powerless and it's confusing. Now, why is it confusing? Well, it's confusing. Like, how exactly do you form human souls, right? That's tricky. How do I influence people? Like, and what do I do? Do I want people around me to think just like I do? Or what parts of my own thoughts and family culture do I go, this is something to improve on or this is something to move on from? Uh, so much of influence is trying to help people navigate through, let's just be honest, our world is quickly changing, it's chaotic, I get confused by it, and we don't always have things figured out. So how do you influence people when you're not sure what to do yourself? Forming human souls, I hate to say it, it's also isolating. You know this, I mean, think about, think about what happens when you be that one person that's the voice of reason to somebody who doesn't want to hear it. I mean, sometimes it automatically puts you in this really lonely category of people who don't get told everything, right? You get cut out of conversations. You get not invited to stuff anymore. Or, um, you know, I'll just throw this out there. I think parents are some of the loneliest people you'll meet because you raise kids, which means you say yes to bedtime, mealtime, playtime, that's all great, but it means you're saying no to so many other social things that put you around community that you need for a season. We're gonna talk about this today. Here's the dark part about forming human souls. Being one of God's tools to form a human soul, it can be frustrating, confusing, distracting, and isolating. Now today, we're going to look at what God says about just that. To help us out with this problem, we're going to look at the Bible. We're going to look at a very, very familiar passage that you've heard a bunch of times already today. But I'm convinced that this passage, this, these words from Jesus, has everything you need to know to survive and thrive in this season. And I'm excited because I think what we're going to see in Scripture can change you from feeling frustrated, confused, and isolated to seeing the rest and courage that fuels the good, godly work of being one of God's tools to form a human soul. Now, now, this may be the final and certainly most famous of Jesus' commands to his disciples. We're about to read something you may know as a great commission. And normally, you'll hear this verse told, talking about evangelism or outreach or something, but I think it's a little bit more than that. What we're about to read offers both a call and an encouragement. Let me just read this. I'm going to start in Matthew 28, verse 16, to give you a little context. So here's our setting. Verse 16 goes like this. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. If you follow the life of Christ in any detail, this is after he lived, it's after his miracles, it's after his suffering, it's after he died, it's after he rose again. Jesus gathers his closest disciples to him. In fact, you see the number? See the number back there? It's a, a number that reminds us of disappointment. Because this whole time, Jesus had that, how many disciples? Twelve disciples, right? Now he's got eleven, which is a grave reminder that even Jesus had people in his sphere of influence who fell away from faith. So there it is. The Bible just out there, up front, and real about where these 11 disciples are. And you can see verse 17. When they saw Jesus, they worshipped him. There's this line that cracks me up. But some 
doubted, which is so striking, right? I mean, think about that for a second, right? These are the disciples. These are people for, like, like, people will paint pictures of them and put them in churches for a thousand years. These are the 11 apostles. This is the top tier people of faith. They saw the miracles. They uh, saw Jesus make the wine from water, heal the blind. They, they watched Jesus raise they saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. In fact, they're, they're sitting there looking at Jesus, who was dead, and now he's alive. And they do what anyone would do. They, they worship. I mean, here's a dead man talking, and I imagine them singing, and I imagine them expressing their faith in ways that maybe even you do. Like, I, I was looking at the lyrics to this worship song. Um, man, I, I love this chorus. When all you are is glorious, O oh God, you're victorious, and strong, who shall I fear when all you are is powerful and true and good in you? Who can I fear? Nobody, right? They're sitting there worshiping. And uh, again, this is not like us. We're singing here and we're like picturing Jesus in our head or something. But I mean, Jesus in their passes, Jesus is right there. And they worship Jesus like with, a, with a nail marks in his hands. They go, this is a miracle. And even Jesus there. See what that line says? Some doubted. Like, looking at Jesus in the eyes, that they wonder if he's, like, real or there or something. Which tells me if you worship and you doubt simultaneously, you're in good company. Because that's what the 11 disciples are doing. But I also know where they're going. Like, because I've read the rest of the Bible, right? They're about to turn the world upside down. Like, you can read their story in the book of Acts. These are 11, some worshiping, some doubting. Like, they're, they're about halfway there, but they're about to take over the world by doing courageous things for the Lord. And why are they doubting? Here's my theory. I think they're exhausted. I mean, they just wanted to, you know, they, they spent the last couple months trying to get people to not kill Jesus, and they failed. They're working with people who are stubborn, full of hate. Like, they're working with people who are literally trying to throw them in prison. Some succeed. And they're just trying to figure out how to survive. They're exhausted. They feel powerless and confused. I bet they're all just going, what, what are we even doing here, Jesus? Like, remember Palm Sunday? That was such a clear mission. We were going to take over with Jesus as king. And now, uh, well, there's 11 of us, not a crowd. That's discouraging. I bet they're distracted. So here's my question. What do we tell people? I mean, there's Matthew. He works for the government. We got Simon. He's a domestic terrorist. We got Peter. He just cares about fishing. Like, what, what are we supposed to influence people here? And I'll bet they felt so, so alone and isolated. I mean, they're hiding by themselves in this dark room. They left their family, their towns, their jobs, their community. Most of them had to run away from town Lots of them got thrown in prison by themselves. Some of them died. And Jesus has a message to people, well, these 11 people, who felt exhausted and powerless and confused and lonely. And frankly, these are 11 people who are just like us. Folks who've got a big call, but they feel so small. People who are frustrated, confused, and isolated. What would Jesus say to people like that? Do you want to hear what Jesus says to people like that? Because I think he says it to us too. I, I, I am so excited to read this because I am convinced that what Jesus is about to say, and it's familiar, but don't gloss over it because you've heard it a hundred times. I think it'll change your life. This is verse 18. So, so Jesus comes to them. These are people who are simultaneously worshiping and doubting. And Jesus says a couple things. First of all, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says. In other words, Jesus, God, is probably a bigger deal than you think he is right now. I think most of us, we're happy to worship, we're happy to sing songs even like these, but we still don't comprehend how big, big God is. And when we don't see how big God is, our problems look huge. So Jesus starts off by saying, Jesus is a big deal. I mean, think about verses like this one, Colossians 1, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
In other words, this is Jesus, the, the can't wrap your head around him God, the one who made everything. He's shown to us in Jesus. I'll keep reading. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, powers, Rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I mean, just think about that for a second. I mean, you, you don't really understand how big God is. Jesus made heaven, earth, up there, down here, stuff you can see and measure, things you can't explain. You see words like thrones, powers, authorities, like government, management, everything behind all that stuff, like Jesus is in control. And I, I love this line, uh, through him, he is before things, and in him all things hold together. Like, you want to know how big God is? Here's a teeny, pin-sized hole picture of it. There is no system, no culture, no states, no trends, nothing can even approach coming close to matching the power of Jesus. I mean, Jesus not just made everything. That's a big deal. He's not just over everything. But again, my favorite line, he holds, all things hold together in him. Like, if you drop something and you can explain how gravity does its thing, like, you can explain from observations how stuff works, but the one who makes it work is Jesus, who's sovereign. The whole world is in his hands. Or the Apostle Paul talks about this as part of the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Philippians 2, verse 8 through 11, he says, in and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's where we are in the Matthew story. Here's what happened next. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Like, we need to see what's real because it's so hard to feel sometimes. Right now, it's easy to be full of doubt because it doesn't look like Jesus is in charge. It's hard to recognize it. Sometimes we live under the impression that any influence we have is just up to us. That we have to take things into our own hands as if we're in charge and not Jesus. But the Apostle Paul says, one day no one will be able to avoid seeing the power and authority of the risen Lord. And I want you to think about what that meant for those 11 disciples who felt exhausted, small, powerless, and confused in the light of their giant task. I mean, here's, here's my theory. I think what it meant for those 11 disciples means that being one of God's tools for forming human souls means that your power or effectiveness doesn't come from you. It comes from the one who's using the tool. In other words, your mission starts by going, God, you've given me a task that I am incapable of doing. I can't change people. I can't change my parents. I've tried. I can't change my kids, my coworkers, my students, my teachers. I can't change my client or my boss. I've tried a bunch, and I'm frustrated and exhausted because this is outside of my ability to change. You know who is? God is. That, that God is able to do what you can't do. So what we do is we go, God, you've got this. I'm here. I can't really do anything, but use me however you want to use me. I'm willing. I'm able. Pick me up. Tools don't do much until someone picks them up and puts them to youth, right? That's how tools work. The 11 disciples had to start off by going, Jesus, here I am. I've got a task too big for me, but not too big for you. God, just use me however you want. And then Jesus, with all this power, tells people exactly how he wants to use them. He says, therefore, because all that's true, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, wherever you go, whatever you do, whoever you talk to, make 
disciples of Jesus Christ. Your job is to do everything in your power as an instrument in the amazing hands of Jesus the Redeemer to encourage, call, and train people in your sphere of influence, whatever that looks like, to become more effective followers of Jesus. That is the most important commandment you could teach somebody. This Baptism Sunday, we think about our kids. We raise them together. Our children should learn early that their lives don't belong to them. In baptism, you've got God claiming kids. And kids are better off if they learn really early on that they've been given life and breath to serve and live the, for the glory of God, to learn that you know, they don't really get to write their own rules or story, or we all live to glorify the one who made us. I and mean, that's what parents and Christian community pass on to kids. And to be clear, there's a lot of good things to pass on to kids, but don't pass on less than that. And look, there's so many good things to influence people. Like you want to teach culture and ethics and preferences and wisdom and like do all that. That's good. Talk to people about everything. Like talk about finances, politics. Like I hope and inspire that my kids grow up to be Philadelphia Eagles fans. But look, that is not like the mission that you have from God, right? There's so much to pass on. Jesus is talking about with razor sharp clarity, passing on faith, being disciples. In a confusing world, this is where Jesus is crystal. The main thing you need to pass on to people is that their identity is a follower, a disciple of Jesus. And I'll be the first to tell you that's hard. You know, what's easy is for people to live as if we are the owners of our life, as though we will not let go of the steering wheel. We, we drive where we want to go. So we've got to talk about what's true. We've got to talk about what's, I think the best way of talking being a disciple is talking about, you know, you being a disciple. If you're going to raise and influence followers of Jesus, you've got to be the real thing yourself. To talk about how God's grace and forgiveness has impacted your life, what the gospel means to you. Now let me just read the next line. This is so great. And teaching them, Jesus says, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So here's the clarity. What are we supposed to teach people? What does Christian influence look like? I'll give you a clue. It's, your, your mission isn't to pass on your sports fandom, for, for better or worse, right? It's not to pass on your preferences, your philosophy. What, what God has called us to do in crystal clarity is to influence people around you with the teaching of Jesus. And Jesus teaches about a lot that affects teachings, desire, decisions, relationships. It affects money, it affects time, it affects relationships, it affects, I mean, Jesus has commandments that change every part of every part of your life. It affects how you, what you think about, what you scroll through, like everything in your life should be and can be centered around what Jesus teaches. And you know what the best way of teaching people to obey? It's, it's that line we, uh, we talked about in the baptism. I'll teach by my own influence or my own example. My kids, my coworkers, students around me, they're going to be watching me more than they're going to listen to me. So a call to do this is to participate in just being a faithful Christian ourselves. And as soon as you think you could do that by yourself, you'll discover how much you need the Lord's Faithful forgiveness and amazing grace. If you start thinking, this sounds so hard, how can I possibly get up every morning and do what I am powerless to do without feeling exhausted and alone and by myself and weak? The next line is really good news. So the next line, Jesus says this, and surely, I love this, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. When this task is bigger than you could do by yourself, you need to know that Jesus is always with you. It's a mind-blowing promise. I mean, both of them. That you are not powerless, and you are not weak, and you are not ever alone. Because God is with you, and God will never leave you, nor forsake you. I mean, 
That right there, these very familiar verses, this is what Jesus said to people like us who faced the impossible task of influencing people, who felt exhausted, frustrated, confused, and isolated. And this is what helped. And I think this is what Jesus is saying to us. And I, I spent some time, I, I was trying to think about how do you summarize like, such a big message in simple terms. And what I try to think about, what would it look like for us to take this verse to heart today? Like it's a lot about God. God is powerful. It's a lot about us. God is with us. We've got a lot to do to make disciples and influence and pass on the teachings of Jesus. The question I try to like boil down is, what do we do today about this? If you're a parent or a grandparent or a teacher or a boss, like how do you summarize all this? And I was reading, again, Paul David Tripp, and he, he made this argument that I just never thought about before. It caught me off guard. But I think he's right. Basically what he said is, if you really believe what's taught here. Here's what you do next. And he asked, do you know what the disciples did next? You know what these 11 men did? Well, you, you could read about it, right? If you read Acts 2, you find out exactly what they did for the next month or so. They saw who they were. They saw who God was. And they spent the next month or so resting. They spent time, I think Acts says, they rested. They spent time together and in prayer. I think if you really believe what Jesus says here, that he's as big as he says he is, that he'll do as much as he says he'll do, you're going to be able to be a little bit less stressed out. You're going to be able to rest, not in your own ability, but because you trust God. You're able to rest because the one who sent you has the power to do what he wants you to do. And this is so, like, this task is such a, source of anxiety, like church leaders, parents, bosses, we, we get so exhausted because we feel all the weight of all the problems and all the dysfunction of all the people around us, and it stresses us out because we think uh, it's all up to us. We think that the only person that can make a difference is us just because God chooses to use us because we don't see how big God is. The truth is, all the stuff that exhausts you and gives you anxiety about being frustrated. Like you, you've never had the power to change human hearts. You were never given the ability to change people to be pure of heart, repentance, to see God. Like only God can do what only God can do. And I think the weight that we bear is a weight that I think God has on himself. What God calls us to do is to be faithful God calls us to do good to people consistently. But it's, the results aren't really up to us. We can rest because we're just being God's instruments. That's being a Christian, right? Being a Christian is going, God, I am powerless to save even myself. I need Jesus. I am powerless to save my kids or people in my Bible study or my youth group or whatever. Uh, Part of recognizing how big God is is preaching the gospel to yourself every day. Here's simply what I think God is calling us to do. In a word, rest. Rest. Exhale a bit. Go, I'm going to do what you want me to do, God. But the one who sent me, the one who uses me in even a small way, is in charge. You've been sent and be sent, but the one who sent you is coming with you. So you have everything you need to do what God has called you to do. Rest. Get away from the notion that the job is too big for you. I mean, it's always been too big for you. But nothing is too big for God. Fight the notion that you're by yourself because God is with you. So rest. Celebrate how big God is. Celebrate that he's with you. And take whatever steps God's given you, but let the Lord carry the burden that only he can carry. Because he's got the authority. And God is always with you. So Father in heaven, there are so many things we can fear. There are so many burdens that we bear. There are so many things that exhaust us and disappoint us confuse us and isolate, it, and isolate us. 
So Father, today I pray that you would help us to see just how big Jesus is. To allow him to take our burdens. To allow him to free us from the, the burden of success and the, the anxiety of all the things we think we and only we can do. And Father, I pray that Jesus in his power as he holds the world together, please, please, please let us see people around us change. Change hearts, change minds, change the world, change communities. It's, we get so disappointed by people around us. Can you change them? And would you use us to do it? Give us, by the power of your spirit, nudge us give us wisdom, whisper in our ears what we should say to people. Use us to make disciples who follow the teaching of Jesus and help us as we feel alone, as we feel like we're the only voice of reason in the ears of people, as we feel isolated by good things. Can you give us a comfort from knowing that you will never leave us nor forsake us? Help us to see your glory. Help us to follow you. Amen.